Hello and welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode number 52. My guest on this episode is Kimberly Brown. And Kimberly is a certified mindfulness teacher, among other things. And we will be discussing in our conversation today her new book that just came out this month, November 2022. The book being titled Navigating Grief and Loss, 25 Buddhist Practices to Keep Your Heart Open to Yourself and Others. And by 25 Buddhist practices, there happens to be 25 chapters in the book. And when she says practices, at the end of each chapter, there is a mindfulness exercise that she will uh, help you work through or help you practice. And so we will be discussing that and uh, touch on some of the 25 different chapters uh, within the book. And grieving and loss is a tough subject, but um, I embrace it and I look forward to being able to speak with people who help facilitate that in our society and in our families and in our practices. So uh, my conversation with Kimberly um, was informative for me and I hope the same for you. And I thank you so very much for being here uh, as a uh, viewer, I guess is the best way to say it, but uh, you're more than a viewer. If you're a subscriber, I, I offer you my gratitude as well. So thank you for joining us in whatever capacity. And I hope you get something out of this conversation as I know I did. Again, thank you. And I'd like to welcome Kimberly Brown to the IdeaCast interview series. Um, looking forward to a conversation that it deals with a tough subject matter, but I think um, in the spirit of, of Kimberly's book um, is something we can all understand and process and, um, and hopefully in doing things like reading Kimberly's books, um, come through these experiences with a lighter heart. So You'll understand what I'm talking about in a second. And we are talking about her book, Navigating Grief and Loss. I've got it by my side here in case <laughs> I want to refer to any of the chapters because there's a lot of content in here. And um, I will say to the audience that um, the content is accessible and palatable. It's not just a book. It's a resource. It has um, mindfulness exercises. There are bracketed uh, insights within the chapters that can give you a little bit further uh, uh, insight into what uh, Kimberly's talking about in each of the 25 respective chapters. So Kimberly, I'm rambling. Welcome. So good to have you here. And again, I uh, very much enjoyed your book, uh, which is kind of interesting when you talk about a book on grieving and how could you enjoy that? But I really enjoyed the way you wrote the book. Uh, it was cathartic for me. Um, I've not dealt with um, certain losses that I know will be difficult. And you and I are in the same boat with certain um, famil family members. Welcome. I'll shut up. <laughs> I tend to ramble. So welcome. Um, and I'm glad to have you on the idea cast. Thank you, Justin. You're not rambling at all. I'm enjoying, <laughs> you know, I'm enjoying talking to you. And also, it's beautiful what you said about my book. And that's what I was hoping when I wrote it, that people would find it not only as something to read and, you know, relate to, but also as a resource that can really the, use the practices, do the meditations to help yourself through a hard time. So thank you for that, Justin. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And to the audience, I would say that if you came here because the, the Google uh, diamonds um, led you here by a tag or something and you are working with grief, then um, you're in the right place. And we're going to have a very uh, sensitive but productive conversation and hopefully uh, a lighthearted conversation about um, what is so natural and so part of the experience. You know, I joke with people, if there were people on this earth that never died, I'd be kind of mad about, <laughs> about the fact that I'm going to die. But you know what? We all do it. And uh, so we have to have a little lightheartedness about that, which is um, nonetheless very real and very painful. I mean, I can't think of a culture, not that I know much, but I can't think of a culture uh, uh, on this earth that takes death in a way that's different, that's um, sort of a joyous celebration. I mean, there is some of that woven into certain belief systems, but but everything, I think, if if I'm intuiting right, we all do this. We all go through this. And I believe you address that in this book, that, that you know, it's that this is normal, and some of the things that come up are normal, whether you've had a um, sort of leave it to beaver kind of wonderful family life or if you've had more like the draconian family life, you know 
these these things come up. And um, so let's talk about um, what led you to write the book and a little backstory on um, your personal experience that you very uh, candidly shared in the book. And I appreciate that. I like um, authorship that um, brings vulnerability and uh, a personal narrative into the into the story. Yeah, thank you. You know, um, well, first, just that for a long time, I have been practicing and studying meditation and Buddhism. So I've had this training behind me. And one of the the emphasis of in Buddhism, especially today, is on the truth, uh, really just knowing what's real and what's true, not our fears that are usually delusions or our regrets that are kind of mixed up stories, but more like, well, gosh, everything is impermanent. Um, everything in life does change. I will change. Um, all of these things are true. I have struggles sometimes. That's a truth. You know, we're all connected to each other. All of that is a truth. So these practices are designed to do that. And I have trained in them. And then over the last five or six years have had some very difficult losses. One um, was a very beloved friend, Denise, who I've known since a teenager, who was part of my family. And I, like anyone who has such a loss, I was really in pain and suffering and you know, it was very hard. And I felt very grateful for the practices that I had learned over the years because they really helped me get through it. And as you said, Justin, everyone's going to experience loss and change. It's just, it's going to happen. Someone you love will die. You will get divorced. You might get fired. It's all going to happen. And we do our best, right, to set things up so that we um, can live a long time so that change doesn't happen, but it's not all in our control. And so this book came about really as a guide, as uh, what I hope will be useful to people who are in the middle of this struggle and suffering. And part of part of our culture, certainly in the U.S., is that you're supposed to get over things pretty fast. So it's in the United States, I believe that the standard is three days for bereavement leave. And actually, they don't call it bereavement, Justin. They call it funeral. Mm. So you're just supposed to, you know, go back to work in a couple of days. And, you know, it's like all tidied up. And nobody, very few people, you know, have that experience either. So hopefully the practices in this book, will people will find them useful and be able to um, treat themselves with care and with mm. wisdom and with kindness. Yeah, it, it, and that's a good point about, um, say, I don't want to call it corporate America, but the um, market system that, you know, offers most of the employment for people in America, um, that there's almost this commodification of that, um, the person who is the employee, uh, not being given that space to grieve. And so if I'm looking at it in those sort of very blunt terms, what is your, again, steel manning their ideas of what's productive and what's good for the bottom line is well if that person comes back with only a day and a half or two days of bereavement like the funeral leave um what is their uh effectiveness as an employee going to be like when they're struggling especially if it wasn't a clean loss if it wasn't the leave it to beaver uh, family scenario and uh, somebody's really hurting and so i i I'm sympathetic to the idea that perhaps and it can be weighed out by somebody who knows what they're doing a therapist uh, this person needs two weeks off. They really need to get away, clean that house out a little bit, and then come back. Because as you pointed out, it's not it's not cut and dry, right? Unless you're a sociopath, and you know <laughs> that's not good either. So. Right. Yeah. Right. So I, I resonated with that in the book because um, there's a right way to do uh, business, I think, and a right way to have a, a, a climate for or a, an ecosystem for your employees. And I think that should be considered. Do you know what the standard is in other countries like Europe or uh, say Canada? No, or I don't. That's a great question, Justin. Mm. I, yeah, I might, wonder about it. Might be worth uh, investigating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what's interesting too, you mentioned vulnerability earlier. And there was something called Project Aristotle that Google um, research. It was a Google wanted to know maybe 10 years ago or more, 
why certain teams were more productive and others weren't. Mm. And at the time in the business world, there were many ideas, you know, kind of anecdotal things like, oh, you know, the groups that that socialize together do better. Oh, the groups that don't socialize together do better, you know, et cetera. So they put a lot of uh, time and money researching this. They had uh, business analysts and psychologists and uh, social workers looking at all these groups. And what they found was the groups that work best and were most productive were those in which people could be vulnerable. Hmm. And, you know, it's really no surprise if you're a human being that that's true. And so not only being able to take the time off if you're bereaved, but being able to work in a culture in which people aren't ignoring the fact that you've just had an incredible loss, you know, that you feel safe and comfortable to be able to say, wow, I'm having a hard time today and that your colleagues can hold that, you know, and say, yeah, we that's understandable. Your spouse Mm -hmm. died. It's understandable. Mm-hmm. Your dog died, you know? So I think part of it too is, is part of business culture, like you're saying, Justin. Yeah. And one thing I hold hope for in the future is um, there is a, a, what I naively assume is a new ethic of rising in younger companies. And by younger, I mean, people running companies who are under 50, let's say I'm in my mid fifties. So I'd say maybe 45 or younger, and they're they're taking a different perspective. Um, I'd say the millennial generation has a, a different um, take on certain values, uh, especially personal values, um, and those being sort of emotional faculties. And, and I'm hoping out of that and, and the experimentation that might come through that, through the executive level, that we see more of that, that we see um, something a little more flexible or a little more aware. Uh, again, it could be if somebody seems to report at least that they're okay and that three days off is good, then that's good. And they can come back and function. If somebody's really devastated and they need two weeks, then, uh, you know, work something out with them, <laughs> get some yeah. maybe remote work from home and then they can go cry their eyes out for half an hour and come back to the computer and nobody has to, you know, um, and as you just said, maybe it is better to have a supportive environment. I don't know. So uh, let's hope that's happening out there. Let's hope that's um, gestating somewhere in, in the neo-corporate uh, world. So eh, we'll see. But I always have faith that the younger ones are coming on board and moving away from the, uh, you know, that system that um, not quite the wage slave system, but just sort of the drone thing. Again, I, I call it commodification. It's like you're you're a number, you're an asset, you're something that contributes to the to the company, but you're not necessarily held as a feeling thinking person, you know, you leave that at the door and you come in and crunch numbers or, you know, create widgets or whatever. So, so let's hope that the young ones are working on that and, and cultivating that practice. I think so too, Justin, it seems like younger people are, they've been more encouraged to develop and share their emotional life without shame or, you know, trying to ignore it. And yeah. one hopes that this will manifest in our culture in a beautiful way. Yeah. And I think despite the cynicism of uh, sort of the old guard that um, you can have uh, a soft work environment and still get productivity. But I, again, I think there's room for that. And I think it's just an old dogma that, um, you know, you, no, no, you have to have a theory X management and crack whips and things like that. And, you know, no fun, no humor, blah, blah, no break rooms. I mean, this happened with the Twitter thing recently. They got rid of the, you know, frappuccinos and the you know massages or whatever it was going on. And, and I, you know, I don't mean to bring Twitter into this, but it just, I remember there was sort of a purging of all that excess, you know, and back to the, you know, more cubicle oriented work. And well, I think know. that's a good example, Justin, because many, many employees said, no, we're not going to work like that anymore. Yeah. We are not doing that. We're not going to, you know, sleep at the office and make ourselves sick to make a rich man richer. Yeah. And they were able to say no. And I'm not picking on Twitter or Elon Musk. Right, I just right, right. Think I agree with you. There has been a shift in values. Yeah. And to be able to say, no, that's not appropriate. My work life is my work life and it has to be humane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I agree. I'm not picking on uh, Musk or Twitter either. I'm a synthesis person. So we can have that sort of... Um, you know, the alpha guy, the CEO or whatever, or person doing their thing. Uh, but at the same time, you, there's there's room for um, relationality in that sense that, uh, you know, what works? And so to abruptly remove everything without 
consideration. And, and yes, there were probably employees that may have been pushing things a little too far. So again, yeah, it all has to be sorted out. But that knee-jerk black and white dipole kind of thinking, I think, is silly um, when you can find that happy uh, place where you're getting productivity. You, Because to me, I mean, happy employees uh, equals productivity. You know, if they want to show up, they want to produce and you have to manage them nonetheless. But, um, you know, just just having them in a good mind and headspace or mind state uh, is good. And um, anyway, um, but that's part of your well, book, I think... too. You, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, excuse me. I just wanted to point out that you yeah. mentioned re relationality, and that's mm -hmm. another truth. You know, I mentioned these practices and being a Buddhist student, you use meditation to see what's true. And that is a big truth of our lives, that we're all interconnected and we live in a relational world. Mm -hmm. And as much as we might try not to believe that, we affect each other. Mm -hmm. And just as we're talking about that work environment, we affect each other and we affect ourselves. And so starting to, I think that's also part of this emotional maturity and this truth is starting to recognize that, how important it is, how we talk to each other, how we talk to ourselves, how we act with each other, how we act with ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Because Madison Avenue has imbued on us this sense of individuality and rugged individualism and, you know, pioneering spirit and all that. And that's good. But that has to be again synthesized with the idea that you are every single one of it. we can't go out and make our own car you know or make our own medicine you know we depend on a car maker and a medicine manufacturer or a physician that's going to help us when we're sick or a clothier or any of these things you know there are there is a very small group of people that can go back to the land and do that kind of thing and rewild themselves but the rest of us especially urban and suburban dwellers you know forget it we have to be aware of that and have that healthy relationship and that healthy respect for the relationship so um um, that's another, um, yeah, a truth, right? And a, 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 to me, uh, truth is what's functional, what works, right? That's how I would define truth. You know, what is working? What is working through synthesis or through agreement, through consent, through uh, cultural uh, contracts or agreements, that kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah. Um, now, I, I, I've i led us astray on the idea of um, using mindfulness and Buddhist sensibilities to navigate um, grief in the loss of a loved one. So maybe I'll uh, ask you to talk about something that's um, clearly worked out in your book. And again, your your personal anecdotes of family relations. You've lost both your parents during uh, the course of or before writing the book with your mother, and I think during the writing of the book with your father. And so the loss of your mother carried with it um, the added, uh, and you touched on this a moment ago, the sort of added dynamic of there not having been a healthy relationship. And I do want to unpack that because I have a feeling that that's more the norm than the exception in uh, modern Western culture is that there's a lot of dysfunctionality in, in families. And um, so... Um, let's talk to that. And then we'll talk about other parts of the book that deal with, because again, you have 25 different perspectives and 25 different, uh, chapters that deal with, I hate to say soup to nuts, but it's kind of, you know, it goes, uh, the full course of, of these things that come up into our, or present themselves to us in our lives. So let's talk, if you are comfortable with your, um, your own experience in dealing with the loss of someone where there was, uh, a relationship that was not what it could have been perhaps, or maybe it was what it was, but um, it nonetheless produced an affect or uh, a valence or whatever a psychologist would say it, that was not pleasant. It was hard to move through. And, and I speak from experience myself that the loss of someone that you were not in a good relationship with is a lot harder than somebody that you, you said goodbye amicably and, and, and there was peace before death. So I'll, I'll hush and let you. Yeah, you no, Justin, that. you're right. You know, I'm sorry you went through it, and you're not alone. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, many of us have difficult relationships with people we love. Could be parent, could be a sibling, um, and that complicates the grief. And as you just mentioned, I had a really tough time with my mom. My mom was a lifelong alcoholic. She made, like alcoholics and addictive people do, made lots of bad decisions in her life that impacted me and others and herself, of course. And for many years, I was an adult when she died. And for much of my adult life, I felt like she was a burden. 
and it was really I just felt always very frustrated with her she you know when why do I have to take you know pick up the pieces of her bad decisions and etc and so I also had an idea that when my mom died now I didn't wish her dead it wasn't a hateful relationship but I did have an idea that when my mom died I wouldn't feel much, mm -hmm. you know, it would be in maybe a relief, maybe a little sadness, you know, and that would be it. And of course the opposite happened because complicated relationships result in complicated grief. And after my mom died, I really almost, you know, I say I fell apart, but I don't use that lightly. I mean that I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I had lots of old trauma arising. I had a lot of guilt because I felt like, well, maybe I could have been a better, you know, been more patient with her. Mm -hmm. You know, she didn't need to be so harmful. She was struggling. Um, I had a lot of shame. I uh, also had, I had to identify and recognize that I had been holding on to the possibility of a different relationship with her. Mm -hmm. You know, even though she was 80 something when she died, Justin. Mm -hmm. But still, there was part of me that thought, oh, maybe something will change, you know, maybe she'll stop drinking, who knows? Yeah. So when she died, I had to uh, confront or open <clears throat> up to all of this arising. And it was very painful. It was not a clean sort of thing. And the process, you know, had a lot of ups and downs. If anybody is listening here and going through the grieving process and feeling like they're having complicated grief, the one thing I will say to you is, A, you will get through this, and B, ask for help. Mm. Okay, ask for help. There are many ways you can, you know, take care of yourself. You know, obvious, most obvious is therapy and bereavement groups. Those are beautiful. But simply talking to a friend, taking care of your body, going to yoga or you know, taking long walks, all of those things will really help you take care of yourself and help you um, heal. Um, there's sometimes a feeling when you're in such distress to just stay in bed and, you know, not move. And that is a counterintuitive feeling. So I, for myself, and I encourage everyone else to really reach out, ask for help and take care of yourself in the same way you would take care of someone, you know, that you love. And to know it's not as you said, sadly, it's not that unusual. Many of us have difficult relationships, dysfunctional families, and things don't aren't so pretty. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, another chapter in the book that's related to that relationship with my mom is about when your family can't support you, mm. and it just you know that's another myth we have that. Like you said, leave it to Beaver or the Brady yeah. Bunch or, you know, the Huxtables, yeah. you know, that they're going to we're just going to have this happy family and something bad happens. Everybody's going to come together. And that isn't everyone's experience. In fact, when something very hard happens, many people are unable to really respond in a kind, appropriate, patient way. Many mm -hmm. will, you know, do stupid, foolish things. And I'm going to guess you and many of us listening have had that experience. So part of uh, being wise in those times are, you know, just learning how to take care of yourself, how to let go of your expectation of other people, how to say no when you need to, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just echo what you said. And so in my situation, it was just grandparents and I don't want to trivialize people's grandparents, but I will trivialize my grandparents because they were horrible, horrible people. And I was, and this is not good. I'm not saying this with pride, but uh, I was completely indifferent to their loss, um, in their passing because of the history on that side of the family. And so I'm estranged from the parent, my parent of those people and I am in sort of a pre-loading phase of that because that parent just turned 76 about a week or so ago. I've been estranged from them for, oh, almost 20 years, I think now. And, um, you know, I don't know if, how good of shape they're in. So I, I sit and model a priori uh, what will happen when they die. And the best thing, unfortunately, the best thing I can come up with is there will be anger. Uh, on my part. Um, the person was a narcissist, is a narcissist to my knowledge still. I don't think they ever cure from that. Uh, it was a covert narcissist situation where it was a lot of the guilt 
the gaslighting and the manipulation were guilt based and uh, and they they learned it from their parents. And so why, again, I met their loss with indifference. So, um, but I know uh, one thing I do to stay in touch with my humanity uh, is see that parent as a child. Um, when I was a little boy, that parent had a teddy bear and his name was Abraham Lincoln and it was in our house. And so I think of that teddy bear and the five-year-old uh, parent holding the teddy bear after having been, because this person was severely abused as a child, um, had no business being a parent herself, but nonetheless, here I am. And I think of the teddy bear and I think of the young child who did not deserve that life. And that brings empathy back into the huge wall that might be there that's built with anger and built with um, all the judgments that I could assess uh, for the relationship. So I'm hoping I can bring that teddy bear out and grieve properly um, because, and I've talked to my wife about this, that, you know, my first reaction will be indifference and then it'll probably move to anger for what was never um, spoken and that couldn't be spoken. You can't talk to a narcissist necessarily about um, grievances, right? So anyway, and I don't want to share too much about me because this isn't about me, but I want to use this as an example for people in the audience because a lot of people go through this. A lot of people have narc parents or whatever, or dysfunctional parents. And so for myself, I'm curious to know in the next few years or within 10 years, probably what that'll look like for me. And uh, um I hope for myself that I do grieve uh, and that I do go through it. Because if I if I if I approach the loss of this person as I did her parents, then I probably need to go see a therapist. You know, if I and you mentioned this in your book, you have pretty much a whole chapter on this where it's like, or no, no, a segment of a chapter where you talk about this. It's like if you don't respond with grief, if you don't process it out, um, and I'll maybe I'll hand it off to you now. Um, that. That, that that's is that not healthy i guess is I'll, I'll leave it to you in that yeah i mean i suppose justin it's possible to have a great loss and not have any grief i mm -hmm. you know i'm not discounting that possibility but most of the time when someone thinks they don't have any grief they're really either in denial or um don't want to look you know at their grief or they're like you said maybe it's masked by anger you know, mm -hmm, I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't have any grief for them. They were horrible, you know, yeah. whatever it might be yeah. a defense, you know, against really painful stuff. So it's important when there is a loss and there is a difficult relationship to be able to sit with it, you know, just to be with yourself, to see what's going on, to notice what you're doing. You know, are you avoiding your own feelings? Are you, and the way we do that usually is uh, by keeping ourselves busy. You know, we watch a lot of TV or we work a lot or we have drinks or we're never alone. If you notice you're doing that, it means sit down and get quiet with yourself. You know, okay. You're probably having some feelings that are hard, you know. Um, something you said, which is so wise, and it's one of the practices in the book, is being able, when someone has really hurt you, to be able to develop some empathy for them, some mm -hmm. compassion for them. And not for them. It's for you. It's yeah. so you don't suffer and struggle and hate, right? And so to be able, you know, it's really wise, Justin, to be able to say, okay, I recognize that my parent also was a really struggling child that was very abused and they and her parents were terrible and God knows what those parents went through. Right. And to let you know, in that way, your heart breaks for all of you. Because yeah. it's true. It's true. How terrible is that? How sad is that? And you keep your wisdom by saying, and I still know who this person is. And I will, you know, either keep my distance or say no to them, whatever it is. It's not like people think, oh, if I start to empathize, that means I'm saying it's okay they behave this way. Mm -hmm. But we're saying, no, you keep your wisdom. You could say, oh, how painful this happened to me, how painful they went through that. And they're not someone I can let in my life. Yeah. Yeah. And one further addition, again, if somebody's listening to this conversation, um, I think another value that can come from this particular situation, and I will probably do this myself, is once they've passed, is you can uh, make peace with them and you can have that conversation. And I don't necessarily believe in enduring ensoulment. I believe in ensoulment, but I don't think, you know, my mother's going to be a little thing with wings above me, you know, like an angel or whatever. And I can, you know, but there's something I, I just hold out hope that there's uh, something 
left uh, that I can say, okay, you know, we didn't have the best relationship here, but um, you know, whatever the memory of that person, um, I can make peace with, or the um, legacy of that person's life, I can make peace with that. Um, yeah, because they, they won't try to get a try to get a final word and at least at the very least yeah. you know, they, they'll yeah. listen yeah so anyway uh but yeah yeah so to anyone listening um you know i, I would say maybe that's uh, a step uh and then see what unfolds from that so um and um now let's talk about your your dad if we can keep continuing with that because he passed during the writing of the book and um there was some similar things not similar to your mother but um, similar things in the sense that there wasn't, again, the Ozzy and Harriet kind of thing going on there uh, with uh, perfect family relations. Um, so when, so I guess I'll ask this uh, of the author, that is you, um, how did that inform your book or or, or what insights were you given um, going in going through that experience with your sure, father's loss? Yeah. Well, you know, this book was written during the pandemic. It was mm -hmm. written mainly in 2021. And I was writing it, like I said, I had endured this loss from my friend Denise. It was really heartbreaking. And then my dad, who was 89 years old, um, had a health crisis in the midst of the pandemic. And anyone, um, you know, anyone who remembers the last few years, that it was a terrible time to have to be in the hospital or have to travel. You know, so that really compounded uh, the experience of going through his the end of his life with him. Mm -hmm. He lived in Chicago. I live in New York City. So it involved travel and right at the height of the pandemic. I think it was July 2020 when he got sick. Okay. And uh, I had a lot of resentment because, you know, I was not estranged from my dad. We, I, He was not a terrible, you know, parent as my mom was, but mm -hmm. he was a really difficult guy. <laughs> really difficult guy and um you know kind of just couldn't really take other people in and you know had a really clear idea of how life should be and so it was really hard to try to help him during that time I'm an only child and you know I he had to rely on me and I had to choose to you know be responsible for him and I really just felt sometimes terrible resentment like you know why am i doing this this mm. guy was not so great all the time and there was it was very satisfying in a certain way to be able to be there for my dad and for him to uh, accept my help and it was very different than it was with my mom and there was something very healing about being able to do that, even though, you know, we didn't have everything perfect. Mm -hmm. And also because of that, when he died, you know, I didn't have that sort of falling apart experience. I had a very, I think, quote unquote, normal grief. I felt very sad. and Wow, I lost a parent and, you know, saying goodbye, but it did not feel um, complicated or um, I didn't feel a lot of guilt or shame. My mind was not unsteady. And I think it's because it, it wasn't as complicated a relationship. He was able to accept help and be glad for it. I was able to give. And in that, there was just a lot of healing. Mm. You know? And so, yes, it was painful. And, you know, he was an old man. It was not a tragedy. He was yeah. lucky to live as long as he did, you know? <clears throat> yeah. Um. So it was very, it was a different feeling. And it made me... Um, kind of understand that grief goes a lot of different ways. And again, you have 25 chapters in this book, and and that exemplifies that, I believe. Um, again, soup to nuts, if I could use something as <laughs> trite as that, but it really, it speaks to uh, these kind of oblique grief periods that we, uh, grief periods that are from oblique sources, I guess, like um, divorce or loss of a pet, which for some people is a strong family member. And so I'm not um, trying to minimize that. Uh, but I, again, that's something else I value in your book. And I think the people who purchase your book will find value in that is that um, this is a handbook for not just mom and dad passing or your sisters and brothers or whatever, uncles and aunts. This is more um, dealing uh, with the end of relationships, uh, be they marriages or even friendships or uh, professional relationships. And how do you move through that? Uh, because there's, you know, probably a watered down kind of a grief that goes through a, a bad business relationship or something like that. Uh, so again, that's a value that I found in your book. Um, 
Let's talk about the loss of a of a young person, somebody who passes. You just mentioned your father had been um, rather old, um, and uh, in in a timely way, uh, this is a kind of a cheesy segue. But my um, wife lost her grandmother this week, uh, just a few days ago, and uh, she was ninety six. And one thing that um, gave me some um, peace in seeing her go was that she lived to be ninety six, and all of, up until like a few weeks ago, you know, fairly. Uh, in touch and um, uh, aware. Uh, you know, again, I'm sort of handicapping for a 96 year old, but uh, to up until the last uh, days, this person was aware. But uh, we don't always get that luxury of saying goodbye to people in their 90s or late 80s. And so, um, and I've gone through some experiences with 13 year olds dying and things like that. And that is heartbreaking to see that from even a vicarious. Uh, I wasn't. A, it wasn't a family member, but somebody I knew and the, the parents, um, what they went through with that. So um, you address that in your book. And uh, I know it happens a lot, uh, whether it's uh, losing a child to cancer, or in this case, it was a car accident. And that's just a whole nother ball of wax there, isn't it? Trying to... It really is, you know, and what you said, it is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And you're not alone. If you lose someone, love, you know, young, people die when they're young. And part of... This doesn't negate the heartbreak, but part of the fact of life is we don't know how long we have. We just don't know. None of us are owed any amount of time. You know, it's it feels like if, you know, to me, I'm also in my 50s and I feel like, well, I should live to my in my 80s at yeah. least. I yeah. really feel that. But there's no given there. There's no right. guarantee at all. And we all kind of feel that. You know, oh, oh, they were 13 and they died. They didn't live a full life. Oh, they were 25. They didn't live a full life. From a, a, a wisdom view, they lived their life. Mm -hmm. It is terribly sad. It is heartbreaking to lose someone you love when they're young. And it's not wrong. And there's a big difference. And I know there are probably listening people out there listening saying, no, it is wrong. But it's really not, not from a, a view of what life really is. Mm -hmm. Life mm -hmm. is, it unfolds and there's not much we can do about it. And some people do live long and other people, like you said, they die young in a car crash. Yeah. They're, and so to be the person who loses someone young like that is really to stay with your heartbreak, to recognize you're not alone at all, and to avoid as best you can or notice when you're blaming because that comes up a lot you know or feeling guilty like oh i should have known i shouldn't give him the keys or you know whatever it is we should have gone to the doctor earlier um to really start to recognize wow it really wasn't all up to you sadly life is not all up to us we're not it's not in our power mm -hmm. so to it's it is complicated and that sort of grief that goes on for a while and maybe for your life you might feel that sense of sadness at, at that loss and that's okay mm -hmm. yeah and to no one's fault it it feels like that we are entitled long to longevity and we are uh not necessarily owed a long productive life but um as you pointed out we have to remind ourselves and i am probably going to <laughs> go against belief systems that um speak of the sacred nature of being and so forth but yeah we are living creatures. And if we think about how fragile it is being a living creature on a very, very tiny little planet, you know, that's just got this one little layer of vapors that keeps us from being incinerated. Life is tentative and life is contingent. It is, you know, contingent on so many things going right. And that's not to minimize, minimize anybody's suffering, but it's just to, I keep that in perspective. I keep it in perspective for my own life. Like I had uh, cancer a few years ago. They got it, got good odds of surviving. But anytime anything weird happens and weird stuff happened a few weeks ago and it was memento more time. And I thought, oh God, the only thing I cared about was making sure my wife doesn't get dumped with a bunch of junk to deal with. And so I started thinking if I've got six months, uh, I got to do this, 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 and this, you know, and it was less about, oh, I could have been to, you know, living in my seventies or whatever. And it's like, no, I try to be pragmatic about it and just say, make sure my partner is not saddled with a bunch of stuff other than my loss, you know, um, 
And, and I say that again, kind of crassly, but if that helps anybody, you know, that if you can cultivate that and yes, you want to have that will to live, but nonetheless, also the sense that it can be taken away at any time, any time at all. And I yeah. also, for my own self, I say, Hey, I'm 53. I made it this far. I've had such a good life. I've had a fulfilling life. And that's why I don't get too worked up about, you know, if I go in six months, then as long as all the arrangements are taken care of, I'm good. Yeah. It's okay. That's beautiful. And you yeah. know, from a from a Buddhist view, the this knowledge that yes, life is contingent. It's not all up to us. We can lose it at any moment. It that is not um looked at as depressing. It's looked at as like you just said, wow, how grateful am I? Mm-hmm. How much do I appreciate this precious life that I have that is rare and that is very short? So how can I live it? with appreciation for myself and others with uh, in a way that's beneficial to myself and others. How lovely is that? Mm-hmm. So I think sometimes people think to see the truth, the truth being our impermanent lives that are contingent um, is to, is terrible. What do you mean? I don't have any control and I'm going to die, yeah. but you can also look at it as wow, how wondrous, how amazing that I'm here. I have this breath in this body. Yeah, absolutely. And to and to go back to um, perspectives of the loss of young people, I have known uh, I've experienced people sharing that when their two year old passed, they look and they may have been Christian or Jewish or whatever. And they said, you know, God gave me this child for for this long. And this child had an impact on so many lives that brought people together when it was struggling with uh, leukemia or whatever. And so there is also gifts that are brought to that uh, family experience and and the the surrounding friends and so forth that are affected. And I've kept that in sort of my um, idea bank as far as, you know, that's a healthy way to grieve the loss that is sudden and tragic or um, seems unfair is that, yes, maybe that child uh, by its presenting its drama and its struggle to be alive that it helped other people break out of these cycles of well i hate life and i'm a nihilist and you know <laughs> we're, we're not so blunt but you know it's just like people that are constantly whining about life and you know oh, it's it's not fair and then you see a two-year-old dying of leukemia smiling and going i got my teddy bear you know and they don't have any hair and they're in a cancer ward and they probably have a month or two to live that should humble us that should be uh, you know such a beautiful example of um humanity uh and again you can take the the religious perspective that um your creator gave you this child for that reason as an angel if you will to use the language and that that angel brought you so many beautiful gifts uh to uh, to appreciate life and to be in gratitude uh, which i yeah. guess is another asset of of um, buddhist thinking is to you know cultivate right. gratitude <laughs> and also just in you know whether you believe in god or not or have a religion or not the truth is even the most devastating situations there will be things that you either learn from it or appreciate it so it is not that one would wish or an illness or a loss, but when it happens to be able to take all of it in, the really hard, terrible parts of it, and as you say, the blessings, the grace, the the support that you might have experienced or learned from it, and that's wisdom. Yeah, yeah. And to think that a small child uh, is the enabler or the facilitator of um the genesis of that kind of wisdom and and the others and that that they will take that forward into other community other groups and communities and and um you know just express that and uh that will have that kind of ripple effect in our in our social system i guess yeah i hope so i i've seen it i've seen it in people who are very stoic very philosophical about what is otherwise a, an untimely uh, death and a tragedy. Um, and speaking of the mourning process, and this, it, it would be interesting to know if this is uh, something that's relevant to this kind of loss versus, again, us losing a 90 year old, um, b- b- uh, prolonged grief. And you touch on that in the book, uh, right out of the ba- uh, bat. Um, so let's, let's think about grief as a healthy grieving process that has its does there's open-ended but i mean it's uh you know so i guess maybe to start walk us through there's a classic uh several steps of grieving grieving rather um what what does healthy grieving 
generally broadly look like? And then when can we know that we're having signs of um, grief that we may need a hand from someone and we may need help? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there are um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross very famously uh, wrote a book and did a lot of work around these five steps of grieving. Okay. Now, if that's useful to you, and I think it's a useful book, you know, read it and see those stages. For most of us, however, it's not so clean. Hmm. It's not like I think her first step is denial and then bargaining and then uh, I'm not sure which anger. Yeah. Um, and those, I think people go through all those steps, but they don't necessarily go in that order. <laughs> and it's not so clean that you go from one step to the next and that, <laughs> check, you know, check, it's check. really <laughs> not. It's interesting. And grief is a um, unique experience. You know, before I went through it, I thought, oh, it's probably a lot like being depressed or sad. Grief is its own thing. And what's interesting about it is it seems to include all the feelings. Mm -hmm. it, it includes anger, it includes sadness, it includes relief, it includes a lot of feelings. And um, especially in the first four or five months, um, <clears throat> there's a sense it's embodied for many of us in the sense that I remember um, feeling very spacey, for example, like mm -hmm. forgetting things and not knowing where something is. Some people sometimes feel super tired or mm -hmm. the opposite, you know, so it's a whole, it's also a physical um, set of sensations and not just emotional. So to say, you know, what's healthy grieving is healthy grieving is when you are able to experience all these feelings that they start to, they may begin very intensely, intensely in the sense that, you know, maybe you really struggle with day-to-day -day things, but it starts to lift a little bit after four or five, six months. Now, if after six months or a year, you you can't resume your normal life, this is what is prolonged mourning. You can't get out of bed. You, you aren't eating. You aren't socializing. Um, you are just, you know, filled with... Um, maybe a heaviness that is the time to reach out and ask for help because it's not that you shouldn't feel sadness that your husband or your family member died it's that perhaps you need a little help to let it lift a little bit okay? enough that you can still feel your sadness and have a, a, have your life as well which is really possible i was you know, since I wrote this book, it's been really gratifying that socially I'll go out and someone will mention I wrote this book and people will tell me their stories and they're very mm. beautiful. And a few weeks ago, I was at a gathering and a woman said, yes, my mother died two years ago and I am a uh, religious Jewish person and, and there is a very prescribed way to uh, grieve mm. and she said it was very helpful to me, this ritual. I think it was every day you said a prayer and you did it in a group, you know, mm -hmm. so you had the support. And at the end of this year, then you were asked to um, let go, to not cling so hard to the grief. And that's another beautiful way to understand grief, too, that not that you won't ever feel it again, but it doesn't have to be so intense and life cannot fold you can let it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unfold in its right way its yeah in way. the way it's gonna go justin you know yeah. it's we don't, again we don't have a lot of control over it right allowing it to unfold as it is yeah and we're all distinct and we're all like fingerprints so that we need to understand that if there is a a book out with five stages of grieving or if there's a prescribed within your uh, faith tradition or your uh, wisdom tradition um, use that but use them as templates that are flexible I guess and and yeah, allow you said. space yeah and yeah. you even told a story I was listening uh, I mentioned this before we started recording that I listened to your uh, podcast on tricycle which I'll if I have the wherewithal I'll put it down in the description field for everyone to access um, I think it's on SoundCloud and you mentioned and I think it was with Denise it could be your mother but so forgive me but you were mentioning that um you were struggling and you were having some uh, difficulty and um, a teacher in the uh, Buddhist tradition had said to you, 
uh, call on your Buddhas, call on the lineage, call on um, those who are uh, there uh, for you. And he said, okay, you know, and, and, and like me, you, you're like, mm, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do it. I'll go through the motions. But the synchronicities that arrived uh, nearly immediately after you said, okay, uh, you know, Buddhas who are out there uh, in the non-corporeal form, I need help. I need help. Um, and, the, and, and things showed up for you. And so for a person of faith uh, who's listening to this, call on your angels, call on your deceased loved ones and surround yourself with that light. Um, you know, I'm, I'm like you, I'm not necessarily a theist, uh, but uh, I'm open to all of that when it comes, because it, to me, it's the, it's the process. And, and so I, 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 if you could share those, those synchronicities, because I thought it was really neat when you were talking, you were just, it's, things just started happening. <laughs> Called on they the did. It's yeah. beautiful. And what I've realized for me, now you can, as you say, you know, you can believe in angels. I don't think you're wrong. You can believe in whatever. Yeah. Um, I am a somewhat agnostic Buddhist. I certainly don't um, believe in mysticism too much. I believe the yeah. Buddha was a man who came up with some <clears throat> really great techniques that help us live really well. Mm -hmm. Um, so when this teacher who was from the Tibetan tradition and they have a lot of rituals, the teacher said, you know, if you're in trouble, call on the Buddhas. It's their job. They'll come and help you. And I remember laughing, like, mm -hmm. what an absurd thing to say. <laughs> yeah. How crazy is that, right? right? Just in, yeah. yeah, like, right. They're going to come. Dust. Yeah, pixie dust. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and yet in that moment, as you mentioned, when I was really struggling and I was mourning and I was walking down a New York City street. The moment I allowed myself to open up to the possibility, hey, Buddha's come and help me. Mm -hmm. I was just opening up, I think, for me, to the possibility that there was support out there, that mm -hmm. I didn't have to do it all on my own. And the moment I did that, other people started to support me. Like mm -hmm. a, a, a street vendor noticed, must have noticed I was upset. They asked me, did I want some tea? And I they and I had a cup of tea from them and someone else smiled at me and a dear friend texted me to see how I was. And then I, I was on my way to see a therapist and they helped me. So for me, what I took about that was two things. One, my ability to ask for help, even from whether they're real or not, that in itself, that um, action was very valuable to me. It let me let go of the tightness of I'm going to do it all of myself. And two, I believe that angels and Buddhas are other people, that they're here, that we all have angel and Buddha qualities, and we can, uh, we've all been helped. We mm -hmm. have all been helped throughout our lives by other people, and that that is how it manifested, and all of those people were Buddhas. Were they special? No, because we're all Buddhas. We're all angels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was fairly beautiful. I'm glad that you um, heard that, Justin. Yeah, yeah, it struck me because uh, again, I'm not into the supernatural at all, and I'm not a theist, but I am agnostic and open, right? So I, you know, and and for me, it's the communication. It is the um, process that we go through. So if somebody, uh, you know, says, well, you know, the the Palladian Light Council said that you know I can open up whatever and yada yada, and it's like, well they're they're giving themselves permission to do something and so it's unfalsifiable whether there's a Pall palladian lights council but the fact that they consented to something so it's like placebo almost in a mimetic sense or a social sense so i'm wide open to any of that as long as it's pro-social and it's uh meant to do well and it doesn't <laughs> involve the harming of animals or children or anything like go for it you know have have faith and and um and experiment because there's eight billion of us and we're all trying and we're all trying to learn um now i do want to I, I don't want to neglect the fact that in the book and i touched on it but um you offer mindfulness practice in the book for every chapter there is at the end of the chapter uh uh, a five point or so um, series of exercises you can do to bring yourself into mindfulness and to um, related uh, the language and the practice and the mantras are related to whatever it was that you had covered in the chapter. And I found that again, to be uh, a wonderful aspect of the book, that it's not just a book that where you're talking to people and you're sharing information, but you're actually giving them space to take time out and um, set themselves up with a practice, especially if they do already have a mindfulness practice. And if they don't have one, this might be a place you can start because your instructions are very simple and and basic mindfulness is very, very simple. Um, so, well, I shouldn't say that, but you know, it, it just 
yeah, being quiet for a moment is is the beginning steps, right? So I, I want to acknowledge that and uh, and and let the audience know that um, that's a uh, valuable aspect of this book is that you can practice, practice, practice. And I'll share a funny story uh, and then I'll give the mic over to you. I was driving out this morning in my, um, I do a landscape uh, business here in Florida and uh, I was driving out and I got to a four-way stop sign and I started to move and then somebody like shot through the stop sign to get in front of me because they were in a hurry. They were, I could tell they were late for work because they were doing 15 over the speed limit to go down the side. Because I meditate, um, not, I'm not great, but I do meditate uh, about three hours a week. Um, my, my mind self was very chill about what happened, but my body somatically, I, my, my body was like going into rage, which was what I was 30 years or 25 years ago, I was like, you know, I'd get all King Kong on people. <laughs> but it was so funny. I want to share this with a mindfulness practitioner that I was very chill. I didn't say anything. I didn't react. I, in fact, I just, I empath them. I said, oh, this person is late for work. And they sure enough work because they flew down the road, the next road. But it's so funny how our bodies still want to. So that's how embedded some things are. And that, so all of this is being said for the sake of um, practice, 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 it's not always going to be perfect, but, um, you know, we can go through grief and we can grow through loss, um, aided by, even if you're a person of faith, that uh, you find your prayer, you find what it is that brings you into into a place of quiet to um, to process. So now that I've done my little story, I'll pass it back to you. But thank you for having these meditations in your book. I think that's excellent way to amend uh, to what you talk about in each of the chapters yeah you know two things one is my experience in life is that i mean i did a lot of talking before i started learning meditation lots of talking i did therapy i did read books i was really an intellectual mm -hmm. and that will only get you so far okay. it really will i am telling everybody listening here you have got to sit down and be quiet with yourself and get close to your own feelings, whether you do that in with mindfulness or with prayer, or you just sit quietly and walk outdoors, whatever it is, um, that is where the real healing happens, you know? So anybody who reads this book, I really hope they do the exercises. Mm -hmm. And the other part is what you just explained, you know, your experience in, while in the traffic, right? So that's the power of using meditation, contemplation, mindfulness. It is not that you will be free from your feelings, okay? Many people come to me, they don't want to feel so upset anymore. They don't want to feel angry. They don't want to feel hateful. They don't want to mm. feel depressed. They don't want to feel excited. Here's the thing. We can have our feelings and choose how we react to them, just mm -hmm. like you did. There's mm -hmm. a lot of freedom in that, Justin. Yeah. You know, for many of us, like you said, we get mad and we get something crazy. We get sad, we stay or do something, you know, not helpful to ourselves. So this is um this there's a lot of freedom to be able to say, Wow, I'm feeling really angry. I know it's all there, but I don't have to do anything. I don't have to get crazy here. I could just take some breath. It's okay. You know, that's radically different than what most of us were taught. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, especially when uh, again, I don't want to beat up on advertising and the and and what we're exposed to in television and sitcoms and dramas and things. But it's you know righteous indignation and and vengeance and all these narratives that are driven home in the hero story or in the um, in the tragedies and so forth. I mean, everything goes back to those basic concepts. And um, but that's yeah, that's mm, it has to be. So it has to be tempered i think with what you just said so yes like you said you know, be indignant uh be aggrieved of something that happened but the beauty about mindfulness and it was demonstrated this morning and again i know for me it was a check like oh in my mind i'm okay i didn't go into rage but my body was my body somatically wanted to go into rage and i'm like i need to work on that a little bit more so that i can maybe balance where i'm just a little ticked and then my body's nuts because it was so funny it was adrenalized it was do 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 i was just like oh and i literally had to like bring my i was just like dude yeah <laughs> that's like there were two of me i was like dude just bring it down bring it down don't 
no, you're not getting into my head and you're not going to make me angry because this happens every day and people are like this, you know? And again, I tried to empathize with what that person was doing. Uh, you know, granted they could have left two minutes earlier from the house, but maybe they have kids and maybe, you know, yada, yada. So, so anyway, I just want to share that for the audience's sake. Uh, well, plus you might humor you a little bit, just to hear, you know, somebody who does mindfulness, like you just said, it is an ongoing practice and there's, there's no destination to it. That's just, um, work, work, get your, you know, get feedback from your work and then, and then continue. And again, that, that applies to grief and that applies yes. to loss. Yes. And also just to, I just want to be clear to people. It doesn't mean people also think, oh, I'm going to practice like this. My anger is going to come up. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let it go. But that is not exactly what we're saying either. We are mm-hmm. saying you're having your feelings and now you have a choice how you're going to react okay mm-hmm. sometimes you're gonna let it go like you did what are you gonna do get in your car right you know rage after someone no yeah. that'd be crazy you had to yeah. take care of yourself but sometimes if it's someone you love you're gonna take your time and say you know what i have to address this yeah. but not in a crazy way where i'm telling somebody what an asshole they are yeah. it's okay wow i'm really hurt i'm really upset and now i'm going to use my words in a productive way you know and that there's that freedom again, yeah you know to be able to do that wisely yeah and that's and that's owning your power too. If somebody close to you violates you, yeah, by all means, you know, don't don't get uh, incredible Hulk on them, but just go ahead and share what's uh, concerning you because that's healthy too. I think you know if uh, there's somebody I like and I respect and they do something I'm like, um, yeah, I want to talk about this for just a moment and let's be reasonable about it. But yeah, uh, if, if you can be reasonable, um, but yeah, yeah, that's uh, your book is is packed with wisdom and packed with um, support. Uh, so I, again, to the audience, uh, without selling you like a, a salesman, um, it's really a, a wonderful place to have things available to you, have ideas available to you, exercises available to you, anecdotes. I love anecdotes in writing. Um, you, you reference stories about people. In fact, you le- reference quite a few stories in each of the chapters about people who go through experience of loss. And that to me is an, is an anchoring, uh, means, uh, for uh, connecting with somebody or connecting with an experience. Cause I, I tend to empath uh, a little bit in that sense um, that I can understand what somebody's going through. So um, well executed, uh, very well done. And um, we'll, I, I'm, I'm happy for you, as you mentioned earlier, that people will come to you and say, oh, you know, and they'll share an experience and oh, your book, you know, I can't wait for those to happen for you. Because uh, this, again, is that kind of book where people are going to walk up and say, I got through, you know, X because of you and uh, thank you, or because of some of the things that you wrote, not necessarily you necessarily, but what the book was saying. And, uh, and I think that's just so amazing. And that's just going to be such a, uh, a good thing to, uh, to experience uh, for both parties, uh, for you and for the person that you speak with. Um, now, before we close out, because I know we wanted to keep it to about an hour. Um, do you want to talk about, is there anything in the future, any other books you want to write or um, ideas that you're cooking around that you can share? Yeah, you know, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Steady, Calm and Brave, 25 Practices for um, Resilience in a Ooh. Crisis. And that was self-published. And it is going to be re-released. It was totally revised by um, the same publisher who did Navigating okay. Grief and Loss. So that's going to come out in February. Oh. So if anyone would like to, you know, read about some tools during a crisis, and it's the same sort of format knows anecdotal stories with teachings as well as practices and for things like a health crisis or Mm. a natural disaster or for a fire or for losing your job you know practices that can support you through it so that's coming up and you know I'm not sure yet Justin but I am writing a proposal I'm in the midst of it for a book about um joy joyful relationships Mm. so maybe a shift a little bit to practices we can do you know to get closer to each other oh wow that sounds great that sounds really cool well i tell you what my my talk my interview series is your interview series so when the book comes out in february if you want to uh we can stay in touch and if you want to come back out and and talk on that and so it's it's again it's about resilience and and uh, being able to move through these experiences yeah how not to kind of um how to to stay present and okay. available and awake, even when things are really chaotic and difficult. Yeah, okay. Justin, thank you for that invitation. I would love to talk to you again. Okay. Well, I love that. So I, 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 so I 
without sounding sick, I love the idea of talking about death and grieving and things like that, because it is such a natural part of life. It is such a natural part of what we do. And so by love, I mean love in the sense that it is a sharing love, um, that um, that when we can share these kind of conversations, it lessens the burden. It lessens, there's always going to be the steps you have to go through, but it just lessens that, I think, a little bit. And, and, and it makes it something we can talk about openly, because I don't think we... <sighs> We communicate about it, and sometimes, like, like we do the Irish humor, where we joke, like gallows humor, and we joke about like a lot of comedy, like death becomes her or something like that. You know, you get these kind of, oh yeah, 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 let's laugh it off. But you know, I think also just to be able to have these just sort of very matter of fact conversations about what are we going to go through and what have we gone through with the uh, with the topic of of dying and 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 losing people. Um, I think. Those are good conversations. So yeah, uh, we can move to that next conversation. And like I said, we'll stay in touch and uh, and bring you back for that. So I would look forward to that. But Kimberly, I wanna thank you for today's conversation and for our ability to hear from you and and uh, talk about your book and and uh, get the ideas out to the audience that um, you know there's there are ways to grieve and there are ways to uh, bring yourself through the process that um, you can come out on the other side and uh, and still be there and still be whole and in your heart and uh, able to keep going with life. And that's that's such a huge gift to be able to do that. So can really thank you for that. Uh, uh, if there's any last words, I will have a link to your website down below and people can find you there. Um, and if there are any other contact means, I will make sure that they're provided for in the description field. Uh, but if you had a last thought before we say goodbye, I'll I'll leave you with Not anything. Not at all, Justin. I okay. just want to thank you for your time. You've been yeah, a beautiful absolutely. host. Yeah, well, absolutely. No, this this was a good conversation. And like I said, it's a tough subject matter, but all the more um, reason to have it, all the more reason to move into that uh, sphere and talk about it. So so thank you for sharing that time and space with me. I very much appreciate it. Now, I will say goodbye to you in uh, after we're done, when, when I hit the uh, stop record. And to the YouTube audience, thank you guys so very much. We usually have about 10% retention at the end. So if this gets uh, 150 views in the first few months, then that 15 of you that are out there, thank you so much for sticking through to the end. Uh, the book is uh, Navigating Through Grief. Um, I recommend it. Uh, that you uh, keep it on your shelf because if you have friends and family um, it will come in handy so all right Kimberly thank you again very much appreciate it YouTube people thank you so much audience and let me find that here we go